Happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining our fireside chat on how to thrive in the UAE. I want to introduce our moderator for today, Roberto Croci. As many of you may already know, Roberto wears many hats, having taken roles as CEO, entrepreneur, investor, mentor, board member, growth expert, and public speaker. He has over 20 years of experience working for companies such as Microsoft and, Go and Google. He is now the director of value creation and transformation at the Saudi Public Investment Fund, which is the engine driving the transformation of Saudi Arabia's economy. He is very passionate about innovation, startups, and people, where he thrives mentoring young people up across the globe. I will now pass it over to R Roberto. Roberto, it's been a pleasure to have you here as our moderator for this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jana. Thank you for uh, inviting me to moderate this session. Always uh, a pleasure to spend time with founders and uh, discuss, you know, about their story. And uh, and today we are going to 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 focus on, uh, you know, what it is to thrive in the UAE. So definitely, without any further ado, uh, let's introduce uh, who we have on the panel today. We have uh, uh, founders from uh, two great startups. Um, I will start from that. Uh, so we have uh, Samer, Omar, and Mustafa. Uh, and uh, we also have Anastasia from uh, Globetrotter VR. So maybe we'll, we'll invest the first few minutes just to, you know, uh, for, for you guys to introduce yourself, tell a bit about your story. I have your bio, but it's always uh, best to hear from your own voice, uh, right? So, so um, what you've been up to, uh, uh, you know, what keeps you up at night, a little bit about uh, uh, your startup, and then we will definitely go into uh, the questions and the topic of the panel. So. Uh, maybe we start, uh, I don't know uh, I, which way we can order, but I introduced those first, or maybe we can start from Omar, Sam, and Mustafa. Can we start with the lady? Or, or Anastasia, yes, because I uh, let me see, I don't see you all at the same time. Now I see Anastasia, yes. So Anastasia, if you want to start first, then we'll get Hi, the guys. Hi, everyone. Can you, can you hear me and see me well? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, I'm just having some Wi-Fi. It's a bit choppy. But... Um, Hi, everyone who's here today. Uh, super great to be on this panel. Um, I'm Anastasia. I'm the founder of Globetrotter VR. The company was initially started out of the UK, and we have moved to Dubai last year. Um, and it's been a really um, interesting experience, a wild ride, lots of good experiences, some negative ones, and really happy to share my experience with you today. Awesome. Looking forward, Anastasia. We'll definitely uh, get to that uh, uh, very shortly. Um, but before, let's let's also introduce the the guys at uh, Dubs. So I don't know which order you want to go, but uh, Omar, Samer, Mustafa, over to you. Yes, yes. Omar, Samer, Mustafa, exactly. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start. So hi everyone. Uh, super happy to to be here. So I'm Omar. I'm CEO and co-founder of uh, of Dubs. Uh, super passionate about technology, super passionate about innovation. And this is why when I came back from my MBA to Dubai in 2013, I was uh, super driven to, uh, to leave the corporate world and uh, start my own business. Uh, Dubs is actually a really interesting intersection between my passion of innovation, technology, and travel. So it all came together. And Unfortunately, I found two co-founders, uh, Mustafa and Samer, to work with. So, so we, share, <laughs> we share the same passion. And um, we've been on this mission since 2016 of Dubs, which is creating hassle-free travel. Um, we, it's, um, we're really passionate about creating a successful business, obviously, but there's a big social element to what we do in enabling travel to, uh, to people who need help while traveling. And... Uh, and yeah, there's also some uh, some sustainability sustainability initiatives we're really uh, passionate about that maybe Samer can speak about later in the chat. So super uh, pleased to be here, and looking forward to our chat. Thank you, Omar. So we said uh, Samer, right? Uh, hi, pleasure to be here. Nice to to uh, be in this uh, panel with uh, you all. Um, right, Samer Subah. I'm uh, from Lebanon. Uh, worked after I graduated um, from computer and communications en engineering, worked for 10 years in Shell, so oil and gas, doing different roles between technical, IT, commercial, and trading roles. And uh, that's one, as Omar said, unfortunately or fortunately, we got together 
to, um, to, to actually scratch a niche, which we had to do our own thing. So entrepreneurship is, um, is something the three of us were very passionate about and waiting for that one idea that it drives us prior to that idea, which is dupes, and um, that we can discuss um, in a bit. We had a lot of brainstormings, what we can do, what we cannot do. And this is really the magic of entrepreneurship and innovation is finding that one thing that drives uh, drives the next steps. So the next uh, the steps started in 2016. And since then, we've been on this mission to, to, um, to solve one pin, pain point that we found uh, in 2016. And since then, we've been exploring the solutions we can for this uh, pain point for, for travelers, for, for corporate uh, partners, and, and going through this route of entrepreneurship in Dubai and from Dubai to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Uh, Mustafa? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, nice to meet you, everyone. I'm uh, Mustafa Al-Maghrabi. I have an electrical engineering background. And uh, before that, I am an athlete. I'm an international water polo player. And uh, the reason I'm saying that because it helped a lot in building my character. It taught me a lot about perseverance and about hard work. And especially when it comes to sports, there are no shortcuts. It means that hard work always pays off. And starting my career, I started uh, with a very small business when I was uh, 12 years old. I always wanted to be successful and rich, but eventually everyone wanted that. So when I was 12 years old, I used to access the internet because it was a luxury back on the days that not everyone had the internet. So I used to go through the dial up and uh, download the images of an athlete, especially sportsmen and uh, put pictures and then sell them to my teammates. So this is my first business ever and then the second business was mainly another startup in 2014 it's called explorant which mainly we used to help students who are interested in studying abroad mainly in canada and the us from the middle east we have a platform for them when which they register and then they apply online and we arrange a tour for them to go on campus and visit this campus on site and know the neighborhood and be familiar how it look and feels like to be student abroad and last but not least we started loops in 2016 and uh, as Omar and Samir mentioned, we have a very interesting story to share. And eventually the questions will come and happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. It's amazing, uh, Mustafa and everyone, right? So it's uh, feel the energy and uh, a lot of excitement and great stories, by the way. So it's, it's, it's gonna be a, a great conversation. And by the way, you just mentioned it, Mustafa. I forgot to mention it before. Uh, so for the audience and everyone uh, attending today, feel free to uh, write at any time, uh, whenever you know the conversation uh, sparks any sort of questions, uh, just write it in the chat. And we are making sure we will leave uh, probably a good 15 minutes at the end, right? So to... <clears throat> Cover any any questions that you might you might have. Um, so uh, the, the the topic uh, of the session today is uh, thriving in the UAE, right? So the focus today is also why why the UAE, and probably let's start there. So uh, let's start from what 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 do you think set the UAE apart? So why, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, you would choose to either move or set if you're already in the UAE your your business, your startup in the UAE, right? So and Anastasia, I will maybe start from you because you said you just basically I say just but. You said you moved a, a year ago, right? So you are uh, still a bit of fresh, fresh eyes to, to the region, to the UAE, to Dubai. So um, what what made you move and why? Why the UAE? Uh, sure, well, there's a couple of reasons for it. Um, I actually came to Dubai for the first time at the end of 2020. So Globe Charter was accepted into the Interlock Incubator and we had to come to Giatex to pitch. And this was a time when the whole world was in lockdown and it was like the only in-person conference that year. And so I came to Dubai and I saw that everything was open, the restaurants were open, like life was, you know, like people were living their lives. And I thought, okay, this is really interesting. This is not like what's going on in Europe. It made me think. Um, and so I actually came down and spent time here to understand more about the market, to understand more about living here. And I fell in love with it. And so we decided to take advantage of the fact that we can set up a company. Um, and this was provided by Interlock as well as part of their support package to us. So we get um, a space and they're also putting us in touch with DWTC to set up the entity um, to move down here to um, grow in this region. 
That's that's amazing. You you took me back to those days. Uh, I was there in the Jitex, uh, and and it felt uh, odd, or it felt uh, you know something weird or different, right? So after after those months of lockdown, um, uh, Omar, uh, Mustafa, Samer, uh, I address you all, but uh, of course whoever wants to take this. So uh, you you were in the region already since uh, since uh, longer, right? So uh, why 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 do you think the UAE for founders is is a place that is 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 thriving and is a, is a good opportunity? Um, so yeah, actually, I've, uh, I think uh, Samir and I and most of a bit later, we've been in uh, the UAE since 2007. So we saw a huge, huge, huge positive uh, transformation. Um, I think if you want to deep dive specifically onto entrepreneurship and, and innovation, I think what the, the three elements that you would need as an entrepreneur is infrastructure, uh, is the community, and is access to travel partners. These are the, the, the three th main things, like infrastructure slash regulation. Uh, for the first part, I think there's no place better in terms of getting access to easy infrastructure in terms of, let's say, communication, internet connectivity to the world, all of these things. Uh, if you want to go to a conference in Europe or in Asia, etc. So Dubai is, is a great place that, that enables uh, all of that. Uh, one area that's uh, also regulation has been uh, improving quite a lot and becoming much more favorable for, for an entrepreneur. It's much easier now to set up a company. Uh, now, free zone or mainland, uh, I think it's becoming all both feasible options for an entrepreneur. A lot of the overhead costs that we used to incur as a small business that can't afford now, actually, they're, they're no longer required. So there's a lot happening uh, in that sense. Uh, of course, there's a lot of partners that are interested in the innovation scene here now. So access to funding has become easier. So there's a lot of venture capitalists that either new funds are coming or existing funds are growing. Uh, so which means that startups have more access uh, to capital. And if I want to talk specifically about us, travel. Uh, so being part of an incubator such as Intelag that gives us access to Danata, to Emirates, is something really very, very unique. And uh, this is why... Um, this is why as a travel startup specifically, I feel Dubai is, uh, is a prime, uh, prime location. And last but not least, um, like fellow entrepreneurs, the, we can really connect with them here and in multiple forums. And this makes everything easy. I mean, you need a support group as, as, a, as an entrepreneur and definitely Dubai is a place where, uh, where you have access to that. That's that's amazing, Omar. You just mentioned something, especially when you mentioned the partnership side and on travel, right? So because sometimes we tend to uh, 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 you know compare ecosystems and say we should be the next Silicon Valley, we should be this and that. While every ecosystem has their own unique angles or unique assets, right? So in travel, for example, in the region has been one one of those where uh, you know the region and UAE in particular and, and Emirates in Telak are, are great examples of of you know being uh, being really proud of having creating a platform right so uh, and looking at innovation ahead of anyone else and being uh, the global leader in travel tourism and, and aviation um i don't know summer uh, and and mustafa anything you 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 want to add on, on the UAE or maybe a different angle would be from your perspective, what are the what are the unique marketing or market opportunities? Sorry, that the UE offers to to founders and to startups. Yeah, of course. Before answering the question, I would like to go back what Omar mentioned. Mm -hmm. I have a real example of what happened, especially with Dubs. So we started Dubs in Dubai, right? And they embraced innovation and they liked the story because it was the first of its kind worldwide, maybe, right? So they were very receptive. When I remember when I pitched here in my home country. It's like their first question is like, what is it implemented in the world? They don't want to be the first. They don't want to take the risk. They always want to be the, the least risk averse, you know? It's like, they don't want to take whatever. They want to make sure that everyone has implemented it and then they will implement it. So this is one of the things that I really like about Dubai is that they want to be the first in everything related to innovation and they don't mind taking the risk. And that's why they have this ecosystem of innovation that helping uh, startups to prosper and to collaborate together. That's an amazing point because I just read yesterday an interview to Sundar, um, the CEO of Google, um, where they were challenging him a little bit on you know this uh, 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 OpenAI, ChatGPT, and Google being perceived to be a little behind, right? So with Bard and everything, and he said, "Look, in our in our history as Google, we have never been uh, the first." 
but we've been uh, we've been coming after, but doing it better, right? So doing more relevant for for users. So, but but it's true that that this drive and desire to be in the first in the region is has been. Uh, Counterbalancing the fact that there is a lot of risk aversity, right? So, and there is stigma around reputation maybe at large across the broader region. So, this helps a lot uh, attracting founders, entrepreneurs that really want to to try new things and to develop new and bring new ideas, new products. Um, Summer, any any thoughts uh, from you on market opportunities you see from the UAE uh, uh, as a founder, as an entrepreneur? Because, um, like we we spoke a little bit about regulations, but one big component to our business uh, is security. And I remember when we first met the police, um, they their input was, this is a new. If you came to us many years ago, we would have immediately said no. However, we have a new requirement that came obviously from top down to change our approach to things from, from security to happiness and, and customer service. Security is their, again, police, this is their job, security, full stop. But they said, we, we need to do this right. But for, when we deal with people, we need to look after people and customer service. And they worked with us to reach the regulation required to regulate our business. And this is very, very unique in terms of how uh, the police at this case, but many other regulatory authorities look into things here. And as, as uh, Mustafa said, in our maybe home countries, they have different ways of looking at it that guarantees that a business idea like ours would have never started as, as it did here. So that's definitely unique. And uh, and it, it it came after years of, of a growth. So it didn't come from nothing. As Omar said, we've been here since 2007, on and off. And we've seen how, where they were, and with proper planning, they, they reached a place where we're talking about entrepreneurship in the UE being one of the leading places in the region. Yeah, that, that's an amazing example, uh, Summer. Uh, that uh, you know gets to the root of, of where the UAE is at today, right? So there is this um, uh, dynamic of uh, the shifting the economy from oil to knowledge based, and this desire that, that Mustafa mentioned right now, right? So being the first, which means there is a lot of emphasis on on the importance of regulation. And I would add another element to this, which is the speed at which this is happening in the region compared to other more mature ecosystems. In my in my job at Microsoft, I was involved in some of uh, uh, initiatives with the government where there were regulations involved, and, and sometimes I've seen it happening in a matter of a few weeks, which is unbelievably amazing, right? So to see the speed at which certain things uh, are happening in the region, which definitely offer a unique opportunity. Uh, what about uh, uh, Anastasia? What about uh, uh, you? Someone someone mentioned this, uh, you know, concept of being the first, uh, you know, this attitude towards risk. Coming from Europe, how do you see uh, this and uh, what other opportunities, if any uh, more, you would want to add to what you've seen so far? Of course, um, I do agree with that. And that's also one of the major things that attracted me to Dubai. Uh, it's this ambition and this appetite to actually try new things and not be afraid to maybe make a mistake down the way. But at least you're, you know, you're growing, you're developing, you're bringing out things that amaze people over the world. Uh, from our perspective, I mean, we create virtual city guides, we create virtual experiences. It's not a regulated activity like what the guys at Dubes are doing. Um, however, I found that, you know, coming into Dubai, I was actually able to see more application to our products and our tech. So if before it was really, okay, we're going to use this for marketing, we're going to work with travel brands, we're going to work with destinations, this is an awesome product that really engages people, that encourages them to travel. Um, during the pandemic, we launched a virtual um, city guides, which people could virtually travel um, and really still discover cities, um, you know, while the whole world was on lockdown. But here, I'm now realizing that actually we could use this for other areas because it's not so structured and it's not so regulated and it's not so formal um you know we are now looking at how can we use this at education um how can we implement implement this in other industries you know development um people of determination um, real estate so i just feel like there is a lot more opportunity uh to apply the product that we already have in the local market 
That's amazing. Um, that's that's really great to hear as well. The fact that uh, you know you 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 find it also easy to uh, expand uh, uh, or keep you know expanding your product uh, towards uh, adjacent or other sectors or industries and they're receptive to to the ideas. Um, someone mentioned before in the conversation. I think it was Omar about funding. Um, and uh, I'm curious because it's one of the key uh, elements, right? When we talk about uh, <clears throat> enabling the startups and founders, of course, into, into an ecosystem. But what about uh, funding in the UAE? So what are some of the common mistakes that you have seen uh, startups or founders doing specifically uh, you know, in, in the UAE and, and how they could potentially avoid them? Yeah, I don't know who wants to start first, who has, more, uh, who has been more exposed in the group to, to, to the local VC ecosystem. So maybe Omar, you mentioned funding. So I don't want to, yeah, to so put yeah, you on this one. <laughs> the last time we raised fund was in 2018. So when uh, when the Donata acquisition happened. So so we're uh, we're a little bit far away from from the scene as as let's say seeking uh, seeking investment. But uh, but but one of the key key mistakes that uh, that have if if we're talking about mistakes uh, specifically is that. Uh, entrepreneurs by by default they're uh, they're excited and super passionate about their idea this is this is a trait that every entrepreneur has but i think uh, sometimes the game plan on how to reach certain numbers is is very important that uh, that the vc looks for they, they're not looking for the accuracy of the numbers but how do you believe you can you can reach this number and i think the most common mistake that that i've seen is that people say oh my addressable market is 10 billion even if I get 0.01% of this addressable market, then then we will make uh, uh, 10 million or whatever whatever it is. So so I think really it's it's when when like every idea is great and but but the game plan how to reach the numbers, how to get this very first initial first customer, and having a plan to get that first customer is what an investor needs to know because if you can get your first customer and your tenth customer, you can reach your target. But uh, but just keeping it vague and saying, look, the market is this big, and then even if I get a small fraction of it, I'll be successful. This is where there's a big gap and an immediate X from an investor. That's a great point. Uh, that's a, a great point. And having assisted to so many pitches, let's say weekly, uh, you, you always get to that part of the of the pitch deck, right? So the, the total addressable market, and, and inevitably, uh, uh, you know, you 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 hear a, a little bit of all those stories. But it's very important that founders focus on the plan how to get to the customers what's the go to market and really uh, what are the, the 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 key things that they are doing in you know in the in the next few months uh, to get there um, i will i will oh yeah mustafa please yes yeah, i just wanted to add to this point because it's very yes. important it's like sometimes you go with the business plan for five years right and uh, in reality startups doesn't know this uh, how, what will happen tomorrow not in the five years so as like Mike Tyson said, is like everyone has a plan unless the, until they got punched in the face, right, in the ring. So this is exactly what happens for you as a as a startup. Is like you don't have all the answers, but you have assumptions, and these critical assumptions you need to make sure that exists and that it's accurate and it's um, persistently strong. That this is the critical assumption. This is how I'm going to reach this uh, mm -hmm. outcome. So this is you have to be very sure of this one. The second mistake I would say about in, the, in general for all startups when they raise money, never raise too much more than you need. And this is for two reasons. The first one, of course, that you don't want to lose control over your startup. Okay. And the second thing, startups, they uh, breed innovation and constraints, meaning that they, they need to be resourceful. They need to be having limitations. Otherwise, they will not be creative. Otherwise, they will be spending money. Maybe they're very stubborn about the idea while they should be pivoting. When they have a limited budget and you didn't raise that money and limited resources, you become much more efficient and you try to find the, the economic factor that will make you profitable as, as fast as possible. And then you can raise funds with, with a better valuation. So this is one yep. of the things that I always have in mind. Those are amazing points, Mustafa. Thank you for the quote. That's that's an amazing one. Last point you mentioned, I think, is great. And honestly, in my experience, it applies also in big corporations. Right? Sometimes, uh, on purpose, they give you less budget because uh, you know you can come out with uh, with more creative or innovative ideas, and you can do less with more. Uh, and and that's probably the reality or the normality of of the startup uh, where the startup fund in itself, right? So um, there is also usually another point that is raised when we talk about this, which is uh, also uh, not only raising too much money but also raising money too fast. 
right? So, so uh, instead of trying to get maybe a prototype and getting in front of customers, getting validated and do the customer discovery and customer development first, uh, some mistakes, sometimes it's a mistake trying for founders to try and raise that money too fast. I don't know if any of you came across this or, or if any of you had any other um, points to raise or, or advice to share with other fellow founders. Um, and in the audience on or specifically on funding. <clears throat> I so one one thing that might be useful here is I tell a lot of the entrepreneurs I speak to, do you really need to raise investment now? Because again, many people think as an entrepreneur, as a startup founder, I need to get funding uh, to get money, I need to fund this. But the question is, can you do it yourself? Because again, there's there's value in there that you can keep to yourself. And the longer you take to raise money, the more you keep to yourself. So that's that's one. And number two, to the point about raising money fast, is you need to show a bit of track record that the age of people being so excited about putting a bit money of money every single startup past people investors are a bit more mature. And so so should founders be mature that they need to go to market and to investors when they have something to show and and with a lot of um, uh, defenses against any challenge that can come their way. So definitely important to keep that value to yourself for as long as possible and then raise funds and grow when you're ready and 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 steady. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you I'd for like sharing to that. I'd like to add to that. I 100% agree with everyone in terms of knowing whether you should raise the money at all and if this is the right time and how much to do it for. Because fundraising is obviously, you know, it takes a lot of your time and energy. Um, it's going to be a full time job as a founder to do it. And you're basically going to be focused on doing that instead of on actually growing your business. So, um, step one is focus on growing your business to a stage where if you are confident that you need the funding, you can bootstrap into growth, then you get the funding. When you go into conversations with investors, make sure that you have your own screening questions. So I've realized that this was a lifesaver for me. You know, you have that initial like 15, 20 minute call with an investor. They get to know you, you get to know them as well, because there's a lot of investors out there, especially when it's early stage, especially when it's angels, you need to know if you guys match. And if they have the money that you need, and if they have the risk appetite that you need. So, you know, asking very simple questions about like, what's their normal ticket size? What is the market that they want to invest in? Um, at what stage do they invest in? Do they come in as a first investor or a lead investor? Or do they also, you know, do they typically follow on? So those, those would be key questions just to be able to target the right investors for, for the conversations. Yeah, love, love the perspective is, is a two ways, right? So as investors do a due diligence on founders and the startup, the founders should do a, due, a reverse due diligence, let's say, on the investor, right? And it's a partnership. So you want to work with the right partner. It's not just someone uh, giving, giving, giving the money. Um, and maybe uh, on, on this point, Anastasia, as, as you, just, uh, uh, you were just here uh, uh, popping up on the screen, is uh, uh, I don't know if, if you already had a chance, right? So in the region to go and look for, for more investments, but uh, maybe you are coming also from a diverse perspective, right? So what sort of um, difference, main differences you find in the investment landscape uh, from Europe, say, where you're coming from to, to the region? So anything that stands out or is really um, something founders should, should really be aware of in the UAE specifically? Uh, look, I personally haven't raised funds here in the okay. UAE. So I can't give an insight to that, but I am subscribed to a, a channel which provides news about, you know, this kind of stuff. And just yesterday they sent in um, a little blurb that Everdome, which is a UAE based metaverse company, has raised an additional $50 million from a um, GM Digital Limited, which is a company based out of the Bahamas. It's an investment fund. Um, there is money. There is money to be. Uh, invested. If it's not based in Dubai, it could be based somewhere else. Um, you just need to network and find the right partners, like you said. Awesome. And and you are giving me a wonderful assist then for the next questions because uh, I wanted to ask all of you. Um, uh, you mentioned you just need to know the right person, right? So and and someone I think Omar mentioned before uh, the importance of of the availability of a support network that 
with time is now available, definitely available in, in an ecosystem like the UAE. So uh, I wouldn't ask about the importance of building a network because I think it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? So for a founder building that network and support network around herself or himself. But I would ask more, what are your lessons learned or the strategies that you would advise other founders in order to build those connections that, that are not just connections, but maybe long lasting connections or meaningful connections and maximize you know, the support and the chances and then get to know the right, the right channels and the right people. Um, um, I don't know who wants to start first. Uh, I will I start from start. Anastasia because I, I still start. have you here. I have, and then I have so much to say ahead. about this. <laughs> awesome. Everyone has something to say. So, like, we go to a lot of conferences as founders and it can be really overwhelming because you're just like, oh my God, if like, especially if you have an agenda, you know, like you're raising funding or you're like, you're looking for investors or, you know, for customers. If you go in with that mindset, it can be really exhausting. And at the end of it, you might not actually end up with what you came to, you know, what you're looking for. What I found really helpful is when you're going to networking events is actually going there to want to help. Like your objectives to be, okay, I want to, this is what I can give. These are my like five things that I can give. If those are connections or that's an insight of like how to move to Dubai, how to set up a company in Dubai, um, you know, anything um, that you can think of, if you can even write it down on your phone. Like I do this all the time. I have like a list of things and you go to the event with that. And if you're, as you're meeting people, you can offer them this help and ask them, what is it that they need? You know, and then like people will be like, oh, I'm looking for a person who can help me open a bank account. And then, you know, five minutes later, you meet someone who works for a bank and you're like, oh, by the way, I just met this person. I want to connect you guys. And that helps you build a much stronger network than going out there and being like, okay, I'm on a mission to like pitch my startup. <laughs> That's a wonderful uh, feedback. It's being very specific, intentional, right? So on the reason why you show up and, and what you want to get out of that. So that's great. Uh, Mustafa, I saw you, you yeah. were also... Yeah. In addition yeah. to that, uh, I believe always building the personal relationship is more important than building the business relationship. Because on the long term, this is, will be more fruitful. Even now, there is no business opportunity between this and this guy or this girl that I have met. Eventually, maybe in the future, there will be business opportunities. And as Anastasia said, the network is closed. So every people, everyone is connected. So if you're connected to this person in a deep personal relationship, he will refer you to another network, which eventually will give you better chances of raising uh, funds or uh, be more helpful for you as an investor, as an advisor, as a board member. So the options are very open. The second thing I would say is that a lot of weight is being given to the pitch deck right while if you only focus on the pitch deck alone is not enough it's i would say 20 percent is on the slides and 80 percent is on the content and the story and how you thought about this problem and your deep uh, thoughts about how to solve it pitching this for me is more important than just the pitch deck a good pitch deck that's uh, very well designed of course there is a minimum standard but the content and how you came up to solve this problem is more important. Okay, so this is one thing. Third one mainly is uh, our experience with the Dubai tourism here in, the, in Dubai mainly. So during our uh, incubation period uh, from Interlock, we built this uh, strong relationship with the TCM because they helped us in uh, getting the acquisition uh, to the finish line with uh, Emirates. And one of the things that uh, Yusuf uh, Luto, one of the representatives of the DTCM was saying about dupes, what he really liked about us is that we were very relentless in our approach to them and we were very respectful. So as well, you need to understand the culture. Here, people, they have their own culture. Maybe they don't like this uh, business relationship. They would like to have this personal interaction first and then they will help you. They would like to know you personally more, to know more about the character. And if you see the number one criteria for uh, VCs in which they invest in startups, it's mainly for the team. That means that they really want to know you first because you as a person, you're the one who's going to pivot. You're the one who's coming up with the idea. You're the one who's making sure uh, you, you have the integrity to keep their money safe. You will make whatever it takes so that uh, not to lose their money. So they need to trust you. So this is all very important aspects. 
to take into consideration. Those are, those are, Mustafa, those are wonderful points. On, on the pitch deck, totally, totally agree with you. Uh, right, uh, uh, I think yesterday I was scrolling on the LinkedIn and I saw this post where it was, it was summarizing the pitch decks used by companies like Google, Airbnb, and, and the likes. And if you look at those pitch decks, you say, really? Uh, they wouldn't pass, you know, whatever, you know, the experts on how to write the best pitch deck would tell you, right? So, but still, they're great companies. So as you said, it's, it's also, there's more to it, right? So it's not just, of course, uh, of course, the slides. But the, the point you mentioned that is really strikes me is, is the culture, right? So, um, <clears throat> and being respectful of the opportunity and, and the partnership, but also the culture that you need to really understand and embrace, right? So, and, and for me as an expert that, that joined this region a long time ago, around 2010, uh, you know, it, it's something very important. Right? So when I moved, I, I personally struggled with the concept of time in the region, and 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 uh, because it, it, you know, there, it's different to influence time and making things faster in this part of the world than in other uh, parts of the world, right? And the way you influence that. Um, but but I'm curious to to dig a bit deeper into the cultural aspect, right? So I don't know, Summer Omar, if you want to add anything, and then I would, I would love also to hear from Anastasia from a Again, a new joiner to the region, how she has been finding, adapting, or uh, embracing the culture here. I, I want actually to speak about that as a differentiator to other regions. Uh, so we often speak in, in dubs, if we were, for example, in the US, uh, we probably could have raised more money, had a bigger market just by market size. But then we, we think about the differentiator that the UAE, brings and the region as as a, just a bigger similar cultural um, region is this personal interaction so first of all people are very professional so people know they 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 are very business oriented they're focused on what they want the the culture in general is competitive they want to be the first they want so that is that but then they appreciate the personal edge and the personal um, uh, investment you do into the relationship and, and this is what makes the biggest difference um, to, to us. And we experience that, that whatever relationships we put early on and even conversations that we thought nothing will come out of it, actually people need each other at different times in their lives. It's a cyclical thing. Uh, today, there's no potential professional relationship, but, but because of their growth, because of you being in the market for a bit longer, uh, than, than, than maybe others. So opportunities will come. So that's something we put proper attention and time in to invest in relationships. And the three founders and dupes are here. So we actually take this seriously and we split relationships among ourselves that we need to spend time with this company or this uh, ecosystem. So I do that, Omar does that, Mustafa does that, because we know that it is important and we need to deal with this as a work stream within our our day-to-day -day role as, as other work streams. Awesome. Th thank you so much, Samir. I totally, totally agree with you. Uh, maybe Omar, any, anything to, to add or complement what Samir uh, just shared from your just perspective? I think on the networking point, I think, mm -hmm. um, and, and to Anastasia's point, like a lot of times, especially like uh, fresh entrepreneurs, they're going into these events with the mission and but i what i realized is that you need to find the perfect balance between being sales and listening and listening in so you're always on a mission to sell your startup you know to raise funding to get a partner etc but uh, as time went on what i realized that, that the key thing to do when networking is listening because this is where you get feedback this is where you get feedback to improve your product and this is where you identify opportunities that were completely off your radar that uh, that actually you can start thinking about and incorporating. If you're in a mission and you need a, uh, a contact and let's say an airline, you can use LinkedIn for that. It's, it's not necessarily to, to go on a networking event, but I found that networking events are really so important to listen, get feedback and to explore opportunities that were completely off, uh, off your radar. And this happened to us quite a bit um, uh, shortly after COVID or after let's say lockdown eased. Uh, it was a great time to network uh, and to explore improvements to our product that we were able to incorporate. And this gave us our second phase of growth uh, over the last couple of years uh, post-COVID. 
Yeah, that's amazing. It's being out there is having this humble uh, attitude as well, right? So of uh, of being out there and 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 actively actively listening to to feedback and to to people around. So uh, I'm going back to you, Anastasia, because uh, uh, it's interesting for me also to learn your, your perspective because you moved to the region recently, right? So uh, how how have you been finding this transition from Europe to to the UAE? Uh, and also touching on this cultural aspect that we've been uh, discussing right now, how it is important to listen to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the relational aspect, right? So of getting to know people also in a personal perspective. So what, what are your thoughts there? What, 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 is your, uh, what has been your learnings as well in this first year of uh, living in the UAE? Uh, well, first of all, I have to agree with what's been said in terms of the fact that it's important uh, to invest time into building relationships and that... I think here, more than anywhere else, more than in Europe, it's important to be there and to meet in person and for people to get to know you and things will take time. Um, you know, I'm coming from like Europe in London, um, where everything is just like, like super quick, super efficient. Um, everything like is done yesterday. You know, I also worked in finance before. So like my experience was just the yeah, completely different. So it's been an adjustment, but it's also a nice thing because you really do get to build real relationships with people and it's not transactional and there's a lot more trust involved, um, which is just something that you have to realize and make time for. Um, and, you know, on the fact that things do take time, like it's, it's also been an adjustment in terms of setting up the company. Like I think when we had set up the entity. It was a pretty smooth process. We were able to do everything remotely. Uh, when we landed here, you know, our documentation and immigration documents, it was just the most smooth, efficient, pleasant process in the world. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is the nicest government ever. Um, but then when it came to opening a bank account, it took me six months. I tried three different banks. And the only reason why I was able to finally open one is because actually networking. I um, have a neighbor who is also a founder and we both have dogs. So we bump into each other in the park sometimes and we have these like little cry cry sessions. Like I'll cry to him, he'll cry to me and then we go home. Um, so I was crying to him. I was like, oh, here, I can't open a bank account. I'm so fed up. Like what's going on? He's like, oh, but you should try this new, this new internet bank that opened. Um, and I was like, okay, so that's actually the bank that we ended up opening a bank account. And so it was help thanks to that network, you know, um, but yeah, so things work differently here. And I think you have to accept that and learn to work with it and definitely leverage off your network <laughs> to, uh, to assist you in that process. You know, that, that's, that's great. And also one other thing I would say is, um, there is, there is, you know, it's always how you turn things also to your advantage, right? because everything has a pros and cons. But UAE has a unique uh, uh, advantage, which is uh, the diversity of the population, right? So uh, we are ninety percent probably uh, expats, right? So from many different countries. So how that can be leveraged when you build a product to, for example, reduce the bias or to be more inclusive or to build something that you know uh, is a test bed or prototype that, that people really use and <clears throat> and then you know it's culturally aware of uh, a diversity of of users right so that it's not easy to find if you build that in a different environment so that also has to do with culture and and uh, is is something important for for founders um Conscious of time, so maybe I have one uh, one last question. A round of uh, uh, what would be your uh, um, piece of advice for uh, uh, an entrepreneur that is looking to set up their startup in the UAE? Um, I still have you, Anastasia, on the screen, so we'll start reverse order. So, Anastasia, uh, uh, if you want to start, and then I will go to to Mustafa, Samer, and Omer. I think that it's worth doing it. Um, you know, if someone asks me, like, should I move to Dubai and open up my company here? I will say yes, obviously, given the fact that, you know, you do have an idea and a market that would, you know, you would find the market here um, because I think it's a great place with a lot of opportunity. Um, there's a real drive for innovation and the infrastructure for startups is, you know, growing and improving with every day. Um, there's a wonderful community of entrepreneurs. I really love the people that I'm meeting here in Dubai. Um, and it's also just a really great place to live. I think the quality of life here is really high. 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, My friends Musa tell me, like, if you work for the tourism board, you're always promoting uh, Dubai. <laughs> I was like, no, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot promote Dubai with a Florence in your background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mustafa, uh, what do you think? Yeah. An advice yeah. you, you would give to entrepreneurs? I would say be always ready with your elevator pitch. You never know who's really with you in the elevator itself. Sometimes, and I saw like literally business deals happening without the one slide. It just because they met this guy and they know him so through a referral and he has this integrity. So you see like, well, the, the engagement is there. And because he pitched his idea in a very proper way. So he got the attention of the investor or this businessman or a very well connected guy. So yeah, always be ready. You never know because here, especially in this uh, this region, when you have a very good contact, he can open a lot of doors for you. Yeah, this is. One yep, of that's a great great advice. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, Omar, um, a, an advice from you uh, for entrepreneurs setting up in the UAE. Yeah, um, I think the key advice I would give uh, everyone, and and this is something we did, is uh, think big and start small. So. For us to reach where we are in terms of partnership with the biggest airline and the biggest airport and the biggest ground handler and all of these things, we didn't start from there. Our first ever customer came from a holiday home company that had two apartments. So, uh, so, and and this is the cool thing about uh, about Dubai is that there's a diversity on so many aspects in terms of the demographics, in terms of the business partners, small enterprises, big companies, etc. So there's a huge, huge diversity. So what I would say is. When I say start small is really deep dive or hone down exactly on who your first target customer is, make it a success story and start expanding. And then you would reach the Emirates, you would reach the Dubai airports, you would reach, uh, you would reach the Danatas. But having a successful small base of customers is, is the most important thing when you start your journey. That's amazing, an amazing uh, uh, highlight of uh, one thing where UAE is also different in terms of ecosystem. Um, Samer, uh, closing with, with you, your, your, uh, your one advice that you would give to entrepreneurs uh, setting up in the UAE. I, I, I'd say play the long game and, and have you know, long breath because it is a journey, um, definitely everywhere. But here, things take time. Uh, and and people who want to to be part of of, of a successful uh, startup journey need to really think think of the long journey and how do you get from one step to to the other. Uh, we get knocked down every day. I think that's that's part of uh, of an entrepreneur life. It's really how you pull yourself uh, together, stand up, and 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 last another day because one day after the other, you see that. We've been in the business for many years, and uh, and we but what we know is always the long game, and something about the UAE. They, as a country, as as a nation, they have big plans, and it's a great to be in a place like this where there's competition with yourself is is part of the nation, and and as and as a startup. This is how we always think. We, we always look after what's next, what's the next big thing we want to do. It's driven by from within, from us as founders, but also when we look around us, that's, that's how the country is, being, uh, is going. Awesome. Great, great, great point, Summer. Thank you for sharing with everyone. Uh, let me take a few questions as, as we have about 10, 15 minutes left. So <clears throat> I'm looking into the chat. Thank you, everyone, for sharing questions. Feel free to, to add a few more if you, if you, if you wish. Um, so let me pick up a few. So first of all, I have, we have a message from Hong Bo Sun. Uh, he's just saying hi to everyone. He's, uh, he's a great friend. He's a great founder from Bonflight. So he's saying hi to everyone. So thank you for being with us today, Hong Bo. Uh, uh, look forward to catching up with you soon. Um, so first question I see here is, uh, there is a question from, well, this is anonymous, but how, how has the UAE business environment changed since COVID? Has the economic recovery here been quicker than other regions? Um, let me know who wants to take this one. Um, any, anyone who's, uh, who's willing to, to answer this one? Maybe someone who has been here in the region longer enough yeah, to... I, I can uh, answer that. So I think Anastasia said that when she came here during COVID time, she saw that this is things are normal. I think we have been fortunate to be in a place that get its act together very quickly, and and provided us opportunity to 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 continue and survive. And even with proper like what what we've done 
um, uh, we we thrived. So definitely, it's it's been uh, recovering much faster than other places. Um, and and as a, as a country, what it changed here after COVID, I think people it's it became busier, busier with with people, busier with ideas. And and many people all around the world that saw how Dubai and uh, survived and uh, dealt with COVID that it attracted more business. So that's um, that's something we we experienced firsthand, and uh, and we can still on the day every day we see the effect that it's busier in a good way. Yeah, it's it's a great it's a great answer, uh, Samir. And also, uh, you know, people start giving things for granted, right? Because when you get used to something, you maybe don't realize how great some some um, a decision uh, was at the time. But if you compare Dubai with similar ecosystem, could have been Hong Kong or Singapore, and how they uh, behaved or reacted to COVID, and how different, uh, you know, the feeling and the behavior and the humor and, and the morale of people living there has been compared to what Dubai did, uh, you can really see, uh, you know, uh, as well, uh, uh, you know, that Dubai really did something really well, uh, uh, you know, to manage the, the, the COVID situation and, and caring, really caring about uh, people living in, in the country. Um, another question we have here is, is more technical maybe, but I think it's, it's relevant. And thank you, Mohammed, for, for, for asking. So Mohammed is asking what metrics would define product market fit apart from um, repetitive, repeating customers and organic growth hype cycle. So anyone who is uh, in love with Mustafa I see raising his hand. Yeah, I can take this one because somehow I can relate to this question. So when we started Dupes, actually, it was with a very small growth and then exponentially we grew and we got the, and the acquisition happened. And then suddenly, as you say, the product market fit happened. OK, and this is when you see the retention is increasing a lot of people using the same service and even different use cases that you didn't account for. But the metric that really showed us that we're working on something bigger than that is that when we got a lot of requests from all over the globe, meaning that Saudi got very interested in the solution and we got a request to work with them, even in Portugal, even Spain, even uh, Hungary, Budapest airports. So what I'm trying to say is that when you never, whenever you see that this interest is coming as well from other countries or from other entities outside the region, then this is a good metric for you to understand that you're working on something big. That's amazing, Mustafa, thank you so much. I would only add one anecdote here to this question is time ago, I had the chance to interview and to spend time with Uri Levine, who is the founder of Waze. And, um, and, and someone asked him exactly uh, the, the same question. And his answer was something like, um, think about Google uh, 10 years ago and your experience in using Google, right? So going to Google and using it. And think about uh, yourself using Google last week. Did that experience change for you? Most likely the answer is no, right? So, and that's it, that's product market fit. That is the finish, right? But this can add a different perspective to, uh, to, to this question. Thank you again, Mosafa, for your answer. Thank you, Mohammed, for, for asking. Um, we have one question more from Nicole. She is asking, uh, what would you say is the best way to stand out as a young company in the UAE? Nicole, thanks for asking. Maybe uh, one that didn't take uh, yet. So Omar, Anastasia, what do you think about this? What's the best way to stand out? Yeah, I, I think um, um, I think we lost Anastasia, uh, but oh. <laughs> it's um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyways, yeah, you're I'll, right. I'll, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> so, uh, so I think uh, obviously all all startups are looking for growth, and everyone is selling like a growth story. I think what really differentiates is keeping true to yourself and have um, an objective which is outside just the financial or economic uh, objective. Is there a social, uh, a social impact to what you're doing? Is there a sustainability impact to what we're doing? This is why us at Dubes, we, um, we changed a lot. So this always has been our mission, but now we're letting it come out in our uh, messaging more is there is a big social element to what we do. If you're an elderly person that wants to travel, if you're a person of determination, if you're a family with five kids and you're canceling your travel plans because you're too overwhelmed with traveling with kids, this is where Dubes comes in to make travel more, more hassle-free. And this is, where, this is where the message started resonating and started have, establishing this connection with customers. So I would say really from, from the onset, don't just focus on the economic goal, but also the social goal, because this is what keeps you... Um, this is what keeps you driven. Uh, your, your path as an entrepreneur is going to be very tough. 
and uh, you're going to be far off from for your, your financial goals, very far off from your financial goals in, 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 the, in the beginning. So, uh, so this is why you need something to keep you motivated until you reach this point and just start exponentially growing. That's an amazing answer, Omar. Thank you so much. And, and yes, probably it's not uh, only UAE, right? But, but I think, yes, uh, standing up by solving real problems is already a great, great way to, to, to stand out. Uh, real problems that, of course, have an impact on, on, on the life of, of everyone. Um, Anastasia, I see, I see you're back. Uh, I don't know if you also want to give your perspective on this uh, question, because then we have a last question I see here that could be a good way to close with uh, everyone's uh, point of view. But the, the question from Nicole was, uh, what would you say is the best way to stand out as a young company in the UAE? Uh, you're also a young company say, in the UAE. Uh, what do you think is the best way to stand out? Um, I believe that it's really important to deliver on your promises. And it's, it's a good strategy to build a good track record. So it goes back to what we were saying about networking and back to this thing of, you know, um, metrics and word of mouth you know people are going to use your service or your product are they going to recommend um, it to their friends or their partners their colleagues um there's you know a lot of things that can happen where people are promising a lot but they're not delivering and i think uae is really um, a young market where a company that delivers on their promises can go a long way awesome Anastasia, thank you so much. Um, we have a final question here that um, uh, we can use as a, as a final question for everyone uh, in, in the panel, right? So uh, this is a question from Fatima. He's asking, if you were to describe the UAE startup ecosystem in one word, <clears throat> what that would be and why? Uh, and you cannot use ChatGPT. <laughs> Who wants to I start? I would describe it as a vibrant. Uh, okay. vibrant. Vibrant, because... There's um, a lot of diversity here. There's a lot of really interesting founders, a lot of really cool ideas. Um, there's a lot of energy in here. So yeah, vibrant. Awesome, vibrant. Uh, who else? I would say, uh, I was going to say welcoming. So they welcome everyone exactly what Anastasia said is like, they're open to everyone, different nationalities, different backgrounds, and they don't say no to new ideas. And back to the question is like, what's the best way to stand out in Dubai? Whenever or UAE is mainly when you have a story, a nice story from UAE to the world, they will embrace it because this is what they really want to be. They want to be the first. So anything that will help them achieve this, it's a nice PR, it's a nice story. They will always embrace it and uh, encourage it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, Omar, Samir? Uh, I would say it's uh, future proof uh, in, in the sense that whatever is being built here is not to capture a particular moment, which is now it's actually building fundamentals, which would provide lasting growth and a good infrastructure or good environment for entrepreneurs for many years to come. Uh, the best, best example is there's a ministry of AI uh, in the UAE. I mean, this is something super unique. While you have some countries banning chat GPT, uh, you have countries here. <laughs> don't, don't mention which country, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have actually here countries with uh, with the Ministry of AI. So definitely forward looking and future proof. <laughs> awesome, um, Samir. Uh, young, it's young with all the positive things that come with young person being ambitious, being uh, uh, resilient, and think and curious. Uh, so there is a lot of things happening here that you wouldn't see elsewhere just because they don't take no for an answer as an ecosystem and they welcome i mean think what what everyone said already welcome different perspectives and ideas and try to encourage them so so there's a lot of potential uh, and and it's built the uae startup ecosystem it's built in a way that they see the potential as a huge and they want to to go the long way in there that's amazing that's that's great. So, guys, if 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 uh, uh, anyone in the audience then is looking for a vibrant, welcoming, future-proof, and young ecosystem, you know this is the the UAE ecosystem is is there. So, with that, I, let, let me just uh, say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Anastasia, Omar, Samer, Mustafa. Thank you, Jana and Fatima and Nia uh, for for setting up this this amazing uh, session and conversation. So. I think this conversation is going to be recorded and posted somewhere on, on, on YouTube. So stay stay tuned also for the recording and feel free to share it when once ready. 
And thanks, thanks, thanks again for inviting me. I really learned a lot today and uh, enjoyed the conversation. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Pleasure.